already, so we're at 55, so let's get started. Uh, as you can see, today we'll talk about open source and leadership in open source. And I'll try to apply a lens of enterprise to this conversation, but really some of the learning, some of the practices I highlight, and if anything is just guidelines, uh, you might apply to your individual projects as well. So it's something I'll you know, discuss today, good food for, for thought. All right, what do I do? I am an open source developer advocate at Meta. You can find all about our portfolio of 700 or even more open source projects that we focus on on our website. Just search for Meta Open Source. I work with open source and also family of apps. So WhatsApp, Instagram, Messenger, like basically anything in between. And more importantly, I'm passionate about open source. I go to conferences quite often. I mean, not so much lately, but you know, in 2019, I used to go to a lot. And these days, I I'm glad to see more and more people in person. This, this is actually one of my first in-person conferences, so I'm very excited. All right, so what are we trying to do today? And I always like to establish expectations, because that's, I think, the key with anything. Uh, we will talk about why uh, we need to do open source, why we should, uh, how we do open source. Again, I'll approach it from my experience, but really it's not specific to Meta, it's just broadly for open source. Some of these practices can be used. And we'll talk about some potential open source metrics that will help you define success of your program. All right, so Meta open source, it's what I'm, you know, my experience is based on, but really I'll talk about broadly open source. And what is open source? Of course, you are at the open source summit, so me talking about definition of open source is kind of silly, I'd say. At the same time, it's never a bad idea to restate the obvious. Uh, in, this, uh, in this case, you know, it's defined as process of making technology available for others to use and improve. But what it actually means is that we all work together as one community to improve the, you know, particular software or knowledge as a whole. I really like to refer to academia. Um, in academia, they, they always, the main goal of like doing a PhD or doctorate or anything like that is really to enhance broader knowledge in the world. And I see open source doing kind of the same thing, not, not per se knowledge, but maybe some practical things. So why would we contribute to open source? And again, as I mentioned, I try to apply, apply a lens of the enterprise, but you can apply in a more personal individual level as well. First is the community, second is leadership, third is productivity, and last is branding, which I'm not gonna dive into too much, but really the branding part kind of tra traverses every other why, every other reason of doing open source. So let's take a look at the first community reason. And the main, man, the why I'm actually starting the presentation with this discussion is so for your program to be successful, you need to be honest and clear with your stakeholders, internal and external, why you're doing it. And making it clear for yourself is quite handy too. So community, if community is your goal, in that sense, in the sense of open source, it's really reinstating this approach that people behind open source is really the very core of open source software. And working with that, working with you know, that reason, that goal of yours, implies that you need to focus on the narrative, especially if you have multiple open source projects, how do they work with one another? How do you work with your alternatives? How do you interact with your community at large? And having that narrative you know, down, written down as a company or as an individual team is very important. Uh, defining a roadmap with your community, if you have a largely an open source project that is controlled or worked on by your organization for the most part, and you're mostly sharing with the community, giving them insight into what's coming, giving, letting them know what's on the roadmap. At that level of transparency that if anything with enterprise level open source, I see people looking for the most is transparency. So you giving them idea of the, what roadmap looks like is very important for your community at large. Rose, and I don't remember it by heart. Of course it did. See, and I'm not even doing a demo of this talk, and it's already breaking. Okay, let's do the slideshow. All right, uh, then also content and a larger, let me just turn off this clicker thing. It should work, I have no idea why it's not working. Uh, but basically, yeah, the content and engagement is 
for your community to, to be successful and not just having silos throughout your project where you only the people who created the project know a thing or two about it or can contribute and enhance the project, you need to have a way for new developers, for new contributors to work with you, to work on the project. And for that, you need to have content, you need to have proper documentation, you need to have engagement and uh, you know, be basically on the channels the, uh, your audience is at, Slack, email lists, forums, whatever it is. But really have that funnel built for your community is the way to go if community is your primary goal. Hmm. Okay, let's, let's just see what's happening here. Okay, leadership. Let me just see how it works. Leadership is the next reason to do open source and we will, when we work on <laughs> okay. Of course, it does. This is, doesn't work. Let's see. If we work on leadership, the type of work we'll do. I wish I had like a soundboard, like a drum roll or something. Okay. So for the leadership work in open source, it's uh, some people also conflate or you know have a synonym of governance. Uh, you can either perceive yourself as the primary leader in, in the space, but also you can provide governance support in the sense that you help uh, bring people with different expertise, but you overall navigate that space. And what I mean by that is you can approach leadership work through strategic planning. So basically working with your project and your community on overall strategy, where are we going? And more importantly, if anything is a life cycle planning, because everyone is very excited about launch, but how are you going to you know, land that or how are you going to you know, archive that project or give away to another organization? Thinking of that early on is one of the main uh, ways for a project to be successful. Because if you just you know, try it out without understanding how, how they're going to go, it gets tough. You might not know early on and you might need to pivot, but having those thoughts and discussions early for the entire life cycle is very important. Uh, compliance is, uh, is extremely important as well. You have the entire tracks here around that. Um, with open source licensing, uh, code of conduct, all these areas are extremely important, and very important to get right. Fortunately, the open source is exciting because you can connect with others at events like this to ask questions, to inquire how, how other people do it. And so compliance work is very important if leadership is your goal. But in general, things like code of conduct are non-negotiable. You do have to have that to make sure that open source overall is a safe and comfortable place for, place for all. And by the way, I'll share all these slides on my websites, or if you go to my Twitter account, you'll see it there too. So, uh, but more importantly, when it comes to leadership work, it's coordination, right? If you do it yourself as an organization or as part of a foundation, which we at Meta have quite an experience with, and you work on coordinating um, with the entire space on where the project gonna go, or you might have work groups, which we experimented and worked on with React quite extensively lately. It all really goes towards that leadership work and leadership goal that companies might have. Productivity is another reason for doing open source. And what I mean by productivity is a very long you know, paragraph that I wrote here, or yeah, this one I actually wrote. Uh, but really what it means is by opening up your project to all, uh, by making it open source, you can shorten your feedback loop, meaning if developers are your customers as well as users of the software, you can get the feedback from them early on and act on that and improve your project. It, you can go through all the stages of alpha, beta, and GA, the actually releasing the project very quickly and early on, and open source is fantastic for that. You can improve your workflow, right? Because open source people can say this CI, this continuous integration, um, integration we have or that monitoring tool that we use in our company is fantastic. Let's bring it to the open source. And then you as an organization see that it was successful for one open source project, you bring it over to another or to your organization. You can also think of new perspective and new use cases. We at Meta had examples where we would release support, let's say for uh, iOS or Android. Well, let's say we release something for Android. Uh, because that was the use case internally. And then at the later stage, the community implemented support for iOS. And you can think of how much you know, the, the, the scale of our work improved because we ultimately then decided to work with iOS as well. And 
bring back that contribution and use it internally. So your productivity externally and internally can increase drastically by working with open source. But productivity work doesn't come for free. You do have to do some, uh, put some effort into that. And that, in, you know, you need to increase collaboration, actually have the interaction with your, your community. If people are making a pull request or filing an issue, there has to be a two-way street. They, you, you need to answer, you can't just leave that pro, you know, project laying out there with no activity, unless you're clear early on, this is ex an experiment, experimental stage, or this is just us sharing the work, making all that clear and making clear collaboration is the key for productivity work uh, reasoning for open source. You can seamlessly integrate uh, new tools into your open source, because especially if it's early on, it's very much open and very flexible, so you can integrate things into the workflow right away. Uh, you can work on certain data and metrics, whether it's telemetry data or just trainer like usage data. You can do all that in collaboration with your community. And again, as I mentioned before, it's that faster feedback loop, the shorter feedback loop. Here, early on, what the issues are, you get a broader scope of the users who have a direct channel to you and each other to ask questions and file bugs and fi create features. Uh, all right, so the next really why is the branding. And branding by itself is not good enough reason. You have to think of the other three whys behind it. But ultimately, you get to the branding point indirectly through doing well, either of the community leadership or productivity, or all at once, which is actually quite difficult to do. You can learn more about uh, this topic on the YouTube channel from Meta Open Source, where I, for example, talked about open source quite a bit. So how do we actually manage open source and work uh, like that in an enterprise level? <coughs> people would sometimes refer to something that's called OSPO, or some people would call it open source office or open source um, console, many other you know, wording, whatever you, you want to call it, really the way it's defined, it's the organization or you know, formal or, or informal. It can be usually the way I saw it, it would be uh, several stakeholders across the company. Uh, working on the open source operations and structure. And uh, what it means is responsibilities are actually quite well outlined in a couple of resources I'll link, but uh, some key ones is the strategy work, actually figuring out what are you doing and why are you doing it. Prioritization, whether it's prioritizing the particular you know, work streams or even what events to sponsor, where the audiences are, all these discussions can come and uh, go to the OSPO. It's tracking performance, right? Because you don't want to just uh, release the project and never actually look at how it's performing. Because in order for that project to go through the life cycle of you know, increasing the, the development or winding it down, you need to have some metrics behind it. And that's what the OSPO would do. And really community engagement, again, organizing events, uh, connecting with people, sending the swag, all that, sometimes more or less formally done through OSPO. And this, there is a great place called todogroup.org uh, that has an entire guide about um, open source the OSPO as a whole, which is fine because then it's linked to Linux Foundation, which has a great guide as well. So you, if you go to this site, you know, you're not going to miss out on anything OSPO related. But how do we do open source? In general, I usually outline five types of work that I've seen. Uh, there is planning work when it pertains to open source. There is branding work, documentation, and code base. There's also the fifth one. Think about what the fifth might be, and I'll, you know, I'll tell you later in this presentation. So talking about the planning, and I already mentioned before, but really you need to ask why of the, any open source projects that come your way. I work at a company that we sometimes get, not sometimes, we often actually part of the job, you get requests from teams wanting to release an open source project. And it's important for me to make sure they understand their why. Because sometimes people think open sourcing is the goal of itself. It is not. Open sourcing for the sake of open source is not good enough. You need to make, I usually suggest them a couple of goals that they need to go back to the drawing board and make a decision on. And uh, it mean, one of the goals could be recruiting. Try to recruit more people and sharing your work publicly could be one of that, those goals. Contributions, you actually are looking for different contributions. Not all projects are doing that though. 
But you need to make it clear externally and internally, and in order to do that, you have to set that goal early on. Branding, again, it's kind of related to recruiting indirectly, but it's, um, if it's just about you know, your work in AI ML or big data or in that space, you'd like to share with people. And also, it's actually a good morale booster, I see. Uh, some developer, most developers that I've, I've, I've seen myself, um, they like to share the work publicly and it's just easier to talk about it when you, you know, go to a conference, when something is open source rather than talk about the work you do cryptically. Uh, and really, it might be adoption. You actually want people to use your software. Uh, you have to think long term. And again, that's type of open source work you need to start with if you're doing open source of any kind. But the more important thing is uh, figure out if your team actually wants to do it on all the la layers, right? Not, not just the individual contributors, but also management has a buy-in. And one of the you know, ways you can help them understand the importance of open source is through, you know, defining what OSPO is, defining the overarching narrative for the company, and that way they have already reference points, they know how to you know, um, debate over doing open source or some feature work for internal stuff. You need to make sure the team is committed, especially the long term. Because if they just open source something and forget about it, unless you make it clear, I, I consider it to be a failure. So branding type of work, um, it's not just marketing, it actually shows commitment. And I'm not talking about committing with money. You can do a lot of things without much investment, uh, budgetary, uh, financially wise. Uh, branding can be, can consider things like name. Have you thought of your name before you, you know, named the project, right? Or published the project? Uh, have you thought of a search engine optimization? Is the project already very popular in, in a different space that if people start searching for it, that thing comes up first over your project. So you have to think about that. Logo as well, narrative around your uh, project. Maybe it's part of the larger um, work that you do. And the social media, right? Getting proper handles on uh, different social channels. That's an important thing to consider. And one example I like to give uh, in terms of, you know, it's not about the money necessary, and it's actually a great opportunity for contributions. Docusaurus is a big project that we have um, public from Meta. It's a great static generation, uh, static generator site a tool. Um, and this is the logo that we currently have. Very cute, very nice. This was the original logo. It's also a dinosaur. And it was written, made by one of our uh, contributors who wasn't you know, a Meta employee, but that person contributed. And it was a great contribution that uh, you know, went into history of the project. But again, just highlights, they thought of that, they worked on that. And again, it was one of the ways people were able to become maintainer uh, by doing the logo work, the design work, which is very important. Documentation. I always put documentation over code base because the code base, people sometimes put on a pedestal saying that this is amazing, this is the most important thing. Documentation is actually the key for any successful project. If you look at statistics out there of the top projects, you would see that they all have proper docs. They have ideally a website, which is searchable because people go to those things like documentation and sites when they are encountering an issue. And so people who are gonna start working with your project, the contributors, uh, those who try to use it, they would encounter issue. Because people who work on projects full time, they often um, don't know what they don't, what they don't know or they take a lot of things for granted. They already have everything built on their machine. They never actually went through building the same project on another operating system, but your users might. And so having proper documentation is the key. And again, as I said, it's one of the cornerstone of open source. And it's, as I, I'm a firm believer, it's what makes or break a successful project. So when it comes to documentation, again, it's great for contributions. We are holding a docathon at Python. Uh, for PyTorch later this month. You can register at pytorch.org. But basically, again, it's one of the ways we get people who might be, you know, first intimidated by the project and contributing to the code base. They might see documentation as the better place for entry, or in general, they'd like to improve the educational part of uh, PyTorch. So this sort of work is great for people to start working with the project, making your documentation searchable, uh, usually we do it through creating a website. DocuSource is amazing for that. I'm quite biased, but I can say that. 
Uh, you can also use tools like AlexJS, which is a great linter to find, you know, unwelcoming uh, words that you might be using, whether you are, you know, doing it intentionally or unintentionally. AlexJS and similar linters will be able to highlight it in your documentation to make sure documentation is welcoming to all, because that's the key of open source. And the code base work, you know, one of the main things, every single code base, every single project that we release at Meta, it has several files, including code of conduct. It would have README, where we really explain what the project does, why people should use it, and how to get started. A contributors guide, because if you want to build a pipeline for your contributors, where it's you know, usually it's users, contributors, maintainers, if you want to have that pipeline, people need to know where to go. And also, you know, in these days, we have great uh, companies like GitHub or GitLab. You can have PR templates, issue templates, so your interaction doesn't follow, you know, with person filing a bug. And your next question is, uh, how do you reproduce it, right? Or a test is failing, they say, but they don't actually specify what they expected. So all of that is what you can avoid by having proper templates, proper process. So I've talked about four types of open source work. And the fifth one is community work. And community work, as I mentioned before, is it has to be team driven. Team itself, internal and or external, has to care about open source and work on that. Um, it's often focused on content, because a lot, uh, whether it's, you know, it's written content, it's video content, audio, whatever it might be, just there has to be a way for people to learn about the project and work with it. Because some of the knowledge you, know, you keep to yourself, it's in a silo, nobody can actually enter that space. Uh, you need to have a community space for people to ask questions, um, whether it's you know, coding questions or documentation or any sort of concerns, or they need to discuss the proposal. Um, and all of that, they need to create a space for people to work together. And it can be you know, whatever messaging platform you might use. And really, it's all about communication, especially if you're an enterprise. Talking to your developers, to your users, is the key. It's the same idea in business, right? You over communication is usually best. Of course, you take it with a grain of salt, and uh, you know you keep in mind legal implications and all that. That being said, if you approach it from the transparency point or trying to make it as safe and welcoming for all, you would not go wrong. And Kemi Williams, one of uh, my colleagues at the Meta, made this great video about contributing to open source for the first time. Uh, in, in PyTorch, so you can get started right there and you can find this video on Meta YouTube channel, Meta Open Source YouTube channel. So with all that said, how do we know if we're successful? Uh, is there a matrix? There's some single metric that everyone can use. There is no such matrix. Everyone is different, every project is different. <clears throat> so I answer this question again, like every consultant would, it depends. And so some of the metrics we still collect and focus on and try to define um, you know, success or health of a project, repository numbers, right, or package downloads, and depending on the project and the space you're in, um, if you're working in different channels like Reddit, Stack Overflow, uh, some Q&A forum, or social channels, what's the sentiment analysis of that, positive, negative, what's the share of voice, very marketing term terminology now, but it's basically how many people talk about your your project versus the alternative. Uh, so things of that nature you can collect and work on. And there are many um, you know, tools out there, open source and none. Twitter and YouTube, as I mentioned, you know. Yes, please. We do, but it's not open source. We use a inter couple enterprises ones. Uh, and uh, yeah, we do use quite, quite a few enterprise and social media management companies that that do that. They, they, you know, they uh, aggregate data and they provide reports and things like that nature. But there is the great thing called CHAOS, C-H-A-O-S-S, -S, which is a great open source framework for measuring health. If you just search for that, you'll find it. Uh, that one is more guidelines than a tool, but that will help you to pick a tool that will work for you. Great question, though. Thank you. Um, so yeah, Twitter and YouTube, you can actually have a feedback and comments and figure out what, what's next. Uh, and third-party tools, there are quite a few out there, um, but uh, really there is just no single place, single uh, health metrics that will work for all. It depends on your 
on your market, on your audience. I've uh, worked with projects with where the total audience in the entire world will be like 300 people. So you would approach it very different from a, you know, a community of like a couple million, right? <clears throat> so it really depends. Call to action. Uh, really strategize and prioritize uh, when you work on open source in the individual level or on a corporate level. Figure out why you're doing it, what's your end goal. Know your community, know who, who your audience is. Same as in business. This is really, it doesn't, it doesn't differ that much. Uh, you, you need to be, you know, you want to be nice. You want to be, make sure you, it's safe for all. It's welcoming to all. Uh, and uh, you over communicate the same, the same way you would do it with any other thing. And still collect metrics. Uh, obviously make it, you know, work with the community what type of metrics you collect. Um, it's in open source, it's actually very easy because it's an open space, right? It's public already. But um, collect that data so you can ideally find some correlation. Correlation doesn't mean causation all the time, so don't try to make that extrapolation. Oh man, I'm always, I, I'm always talking like po you know, poetry now. But uh, you know, collect that data so you can figure out whether your efforts are successful or not. And with that, thank you so much for your time. Please uh, reach out to me in these places, ask me questions. You can also find these slides, which quite a few of them, on my uh, website. And with that, I appreciate your time and ask me questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, please. It depends to what extent we're talking about. Like uh, our OSPO is cross-functional, so it will be throughout the company from all the major stakeholders. That being said, a lot of the open source efforts throughout the company would be, I wouldn't say outsourced to us, but would be on us, right? So if let's say Presto and Big Data is working with foundations, it will come to our team, uh, right? Or if, uh, there's a GraphQL foundation and we work with GraphQL. So all that type of work would come to us. Your question about like, I mean, if let's say we're doing a meetup at the, our, one of our offices, we would reach out to security and like they would, or NHR, they would like issue temporary badges. Or if it's swag uh, ordering, would have uh, admins for that too. Oh, that, okay, yeah, 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 we do. We do have a person who is focusing on legal, actually several people who focus on legal and any open source. We don't call it OSPO, like formally, we call it open source, just open source team, open source department. I would have dedicated specialists in, let's say, legal area, several, as I mentioned, um, different levels as well, because open source, as I mentioned, is extremely difficult when it comes to legal uh, part of the, of the world. We have special people for open source who deal with budget and invoicing, especially if you work with foundations, it becomes quite tricky. Um, so we do have, we, so basically we have all those covered. Um, I don't know, I don't know if I'm asking a question at all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. I do appreciate it. Any other questions? Yes, please. Generally speaking, we would centralize that budget for open source projects. Um, but if there are extra requests, like let's say uh, for some of the projects which were overwhelmed with number of pull requests and issues, we could talk about like hundreds and hundreds of those. For that, for that particular project that's owned by a particular team, we would go to the team. Not, I wouldn't call it begging. I would say, you have a problem here. You want it to be fixed? If you want it to be fixed in a way where we resolve the issues, you need to give us funds so we can hire a con individual, you know, open source specialist, a contractor, to work on that particular area. So that's where the budget coming from the individual team because they have a particular issue. Because the other option we offer them, let's just archive it. If you don't care, let's just archive and you can step away from it. And making it clear with them right away is the way to go, I, I believe. But when it comes to larger budget for 
open source as a whole, as a brand, and you have a dedicated budget and you figure out where that brand is highlighted the most. If it's a open source for, let's say, a particular sub project, then you do get it from independent teams, but you, you, really, you don't really back for it. They know the importance because let's say membership to foundations, right? That comes with uh, a number of seats depending on the level of sponsorship. And if the team or the project want to interact with them on the le level they have been, right? Like let's say have technical guidance being part of the committee and also management like business side of things. They want to have three seats. It means certain funds. And the team has to, you know, have commitment to actually go to those meetings and want that work. And then we'll get those funds. So really, we're not really begging, but it's, it's kind of central. We try to centralize as much as possible because invoicing and all is very, very complicated. Uh, but if, so we centralize it for general purpose and for independent, like individual issues, we do ask individual teams on demand. Or like if them needs the better documentation, we we'll, like our team, one of the things we do, we do find or work with teams to find gaps in their strategy. Let's say we find that they are lacking proper documentation. We work with doc team that would find those gaps. And to fill those gaps, our team not going to go and write the docs for you, but will help you hire a person to do that. It can be an agency, it can be an independent consultant or whoever else, and they would work on that. So that's where kind of a budget is very big discussion point, but we never really back for it. Because if people, if teams don't care for it, we, we wouldn't either. So that would, the discussion never been that, that difficult in that sense. Of course, if we talk about like, like CI resources and all that, that's a different discussion altogether, right? I like GPUs and things like that, but uh, that, that, that's an entirely separate discussion. And I'm also very careful with what I say. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. I do apologize. I got I got slightly I slightly lost in a bit. So if it's it's, 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 it's in in short, you had a, can you can you repeat that one more time? So there are many companies that are just behind the enterprise uh -huh. sort of software, right? Uh, so when they were in the beginning, when many of the companies were pretty community driven, mm -hmm. they they tried to build their products um, into the core open source project. Okay, makes sense. But that company that started focusing on SaaS or their own thing, they were heavily heavy contributors to the project before. Is that okay? And so, to be honest, ideally, and I really like that model. Of some of the big companies, because um, the VV companies come with like you can think of big budget, but but um, when they're honest about the things they need, and they hire person to do that work, and many organizations hire an open source developer from the open source community that already been big there, like have expertise, to work on the area that they're interested in. Rust would be a good example. I know of some companies who needed a particular functionality in Rust, not talking about Meta, talking about other companies, need particular functionalities in Rust, and rather than doing like internal work, I don't even know if it's possible, it probably is. But anyways, they hired that person to contribute and work with the core of Rust to actually have that implementation of that functionality that they needed. So if that is possible, that's 
the best scenario. But of course, it comes with like full-time salary or action. That's like full-time employee kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> they focus on open source. You can sponsor a particular person who is already big in that space because ultimately, right, open source is not free because it's time, right? Um, so if you your business depends on that, I would say you need to figure out how to connect money to that because just you know you can obviously do the hackathons you can do you go to universities all that stuff but still ultimately uh, you know there, there was a reason why that company went out of their way to build the business around it rather than just doing the open source right so if you know exactly what you need you can find a person who already been active in that space and either either hire them or sponsor them to do that work so they have incentive to do that extra go that extra mile maybe in addition to the primary work uh, to work on the, what you needed uh, but generally if you're trying to grow that project i mean that's a whole nother story right uh, if it's community if you just want if you care about the project to grow you build community strategy around it figure out what people do what the alternatives are is it meetups some companies approach like bunch of meetups some companies approach from articles and videos it really depends it largely depends on your on your particular space and project but uh, hiring someone and giving that responsibility developers generally are excited to work on open source it can be if you have an employee who is FTE right now help them you know if ask who is interested let's let's say say set in their expectations for their role um, so they don't just do it like addition to their primary, like 40 hours a week. Uh, make sure that maybe they can spend 20 time, 20% 20 of their time uh, on that open source work. So you don't need to hire maybe an additional person, but you can find a way to do it if it matters that much to the business, right? If it's a feature, if it's a community and adoption, different story. But if it's a functionality and like t t technical part, there is no way around it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, I, 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 I know it, it happens. It happens sometimes. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Yes, please. Do you have any? This is kind of back to the budget discussion. Do you have any specific metrics that you report up to either uh, the next level above you, your executive committee, whatever, whoever is in charge of the first groups, to sort of justify what you do? Good question. First of all, you need to spend money to get more money, right? It's like in the like if you, if you get a budget, you need to spend it technically. But it's actually I don't see it any that much anymore, anyways. But um, it depends. It depends on your leadership. Some leadership ha has the predetermined notion what they like or what they don't like. Like some might say, we don't, you know. Some, some, some type of engagement might not be their favorite. That being said, you as an expert in open source supposed to be the one to define what actually matters and where to spend the money. Um, in our case, what we do is we have a particular metrics we created, which is basically with every type of engagement we do, whether it's conference speaking, uh, article writing, video creation, because it's also a lot of funds there too, because even articles you can do ghost writing, video, you can do video editing, like live streaming, all that stuff. And so we usually co convert all that engagement in a single type of metrics with, with every type of engagement having its own coefficient and we report that metrics. And the leadership trusts us that we value each type of engagement according to what actually has the biggest impact for that space. So we don't tell them we got like 100,000 views on a YouTube video. We say we got certain metrics that we have a particular name for um, of 100. And, uh, oh, but we know that uh, conferences don't produce that. The conferences make, let's say, one, right? It's a clear understanding that if we continue spending funds on something that produces one out rather than 100 with a uh, video, it's clear that we are doing a wrong uh, work, right? So we need to show that we focus on what makes impact. But with events, there's a different approach to things, right? Events, like personally, I'll tell you my personal approach, going to many events at this point, I don't believe is the 
right thing for, for my, myself personally. For most of the projects I support are for a general brand, but I would go to bigger conferences, like a flagship conferences, like this Open Source Summit. Uh, there is all things open uh, every year. There is some big one, Kansas City developer conferences that I personally enjoy. So you would find the ones that actually, the larger ones, larger events. And if I report my impact and money spent to my leadership on the general scale of things, I need to make sure that I don't just focus and spend money on that one percent. I focus on the thing that gives me a hundred, and so they would see that. And uh, ultimately, it's being on the same page in them knowing what you're chasing. And if they know that I, I I need like a video editor on stuff rather than spending money on the contracting agency and vice versa, uh, and they will see that I'm spending money there. Ultimately, they just, they just need to know the, what the impact is. So we spend a ton of time, and we had great people focusing on that uh, type of work to explain to the broader leadership why the work we do is important, and what type of work we do is important. And after we got on the same page, we need to stick to that one page, the, the, the same page, so they know that we spend money where money give us biggest impact. So basically, TLDR, them knowing what you're doing and just going to conferences by themselves. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, I remember I was interviewing with companies for developer advocacy position. And when a company has a predetermined notion that it's a developer advocate, your main role is going to 50 conferences a year. This is a no-go. This is a right away broken system because this, this, this hire would have been their first developer advocate. Instead, you have to approach it. We have a plan, we have a strategy, we have a product to advocate for, help us figure out how to get there. So if I were to just say, I'm all in on conferences, I, if I were a leader, that would not be enough for me. I would need to understand why conferences. Are you collecting leads because you're an enterprise product? Sure. Are you doing sponsorship talks to broaden the, you know, because other big companies doing sponsorship talks? I would understand that. But, um, you know, just making sure your strategy is aligned with your content and then, th then the budget comes, right? If there is impact, the budget comes. I don't know, it's a long story with lots of branching out, I know, but that's how my, my brain works. That being said, I uh, try, try to give you see some anecdotal evidence as well that uh, that's the approach. But uh, really just telling you, spending hours and hours, spend hours and hours, many organizations I worked at getting on the same page. To, so, because people sometimes, developer advocacy is very vague, a very new position, like marketing as a whole. So defining that is very important. Because there's also like defining marketing versus developer advocacy, all that is not that easy. It requires hours. I would spend more time on that than the budget discussion. Yeah, thank you for the question. Good question though. What time is your talk supposed to end? Is it 35? Good, because I'm in a rush. But uh, please do reach out to me on my social channels. I'll answer any questions you might have. And you will see my slides on my website, dvnik.dev. Thank you so much for your time and appreciate you being here. Thank you.